Welcome, everybody, to another Ideas That Matter conversation. I'm delighted this time to have somebody who has a very broad and deep background in a, a number of different fields, and this is Lou Marinoff, who is a uh, professor of philosophy at the City College of New York. We might talk a little bit about um, the CUNY Grad Center and stuff like that, because there's all this mythology and lore out there about it, I think, from the outside. But um, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but the, you've, you've written a number of books, but the book that you're probably most well known for is Plato, Not Prozac. Um, or is, is there a, a text that has gotten more traction than that because that was a big one um yes that's why if you like my greatest hit okay okay definitely <laughs> but you're not a one hit wonder by any uh any mark um and uh lou is somebody who i got to know in part through something that we're going to spend a lot of time talking about the uh american uh philosophical practitioners association which offers accreditation in a number of different things uh but particularly philosophical counseling so you've been somebody involved in the well i mean actually could i say it like this not only have you been involved in the philosophical counseling movement here in america from the start but you were involved in it before there even really was a movement and you're one of the people who's a reason there there was a movement in the first place is that would that be accurate to say that or yeah, I think it's a generous and probably accurate. I'm credited with being one of the pioneers. There's a generation of us who back in the 80s, uh, and I came in a little later than that, early 90s, but basically there there were people in the U.S. I mean, Pierre Grimes has been doing this on the West Coast since oh, the 1960s. Right. Yeah, yeah. So, so, but he gets, you know, then you have competition between Europe and the USA. So, you know, everything, even something that is not traded publicly will, will you know, there will be turf wars. So Achenbach opened his practice in the early 80s in Germany. He was definitely the first European. But the basically the movement coalesced after the first international conference on philosophical practice, which, yes, I co-organized with Ron Lahav, who's another pioneering figure. Mm -hmm. And we uh, we were able to ho hold this at the University of British Columbia in 1994. Why? Well, he knew the practitioners and I had the wherewithal to raise funds, seed money and host the conference there. The university was very cooperative. So we had a wonderful event and brought together practitioners from Europe and Canada and the U.S. and some and Scandinavia, lest, lest we forget Israel, lest we forget very mm -hmm. strong in pioneers there. And also, I think some even some people from Latin America at that stage. So uh, we had a, a consciousness that emerged from the conference that we were really a movement, a nascent kind of movement. And we had potentially global traction. So things uh, went very well from there. We launched this series. That thing turned out to be just the beginning, the watershed, if you like, of the ICPPs, which have gone on now. We had one in Romania last summer. They've been in Asia. They've been all over Europe, North America. Next one's going to be in, uh, in Croatia in 2025. So every couple of years, we gather as an international community. But the movement has proliferated now to some very large uh, civilizations, India and China, Brazil, Turkey. Yeah. Uh, there, there are some very large populations with indigenous philosophical talent, and a lot of them are saying, wait a second, we need this too, so let's get on board. And we're seeing really interesting developments as a result. So that raises two issues, and I, one of them is a terminological one, which I think is easily uh, you know, tackled within just a little bit. And then the other is much, much bigger. And, and uh, we could call it not so much geopolitical, but whatever the civilizational equivalent of that is. So, you know, for people who are watching in the Americas, what we're talking about gets called philosophical counseling, but in Europe, it's called philosophical practice. And they are the same broad thing. Um, why, why two different terms for the same, the same activity, the same discipline. 
why restrict it to two? There's, <laughs> there's, there are languages very elastic, as you well know. Yeah, yeah. And the kinds of services that philosophers provide are by no means restricted to one-on-one -on -one counseling. It's, it's largely because America is so psychologized. Americans particularly, okay. uh, and there are good and not so good aspects to that. We could talk about it, but basically, uh, everyone is familiar with psychotherapy in this country. Uh, if they're not subjected to it, they're certainly familiar with it, and so they they tend to associate that kind of talk uh, with count with the word counseling. But this is not the only you know usage of the word. Yeah, yeah. There, there there are debt counselors and marriage counselors and uh, and and career counselors and vocational counselors and pastoral counselors. You know, counseling is itself is is a very broad palette of activities. It's not just psychology. So philosophical counseling <laughs> is certainly one on mo mostly one on one. Uh, talk or conversation or dialogue we prefer to say because we don't right. know so you're talking to a philosopher about life, life issues and that's been going on since time immemorial if you go back to seneca's letters and you know stoicism so well you know it perfectly you could probably tell me which letter number 40 something where someone <laughs> asked him what's the purpose of philosophy anyway and seneca wrote famously the purpose of philosophy is counsel Period. Well, that goes back to ancient Rome. Uh, but practice is broader because okay. the Europeans are doing more, and I do more with it, and many, many, many philosophers in America also. It gets less media play because it's not as controversial, right? But we are able to work with groups. Uh, I ran a public monthly event at a Barnes & Noble in Manhattan for seven years. It was called the Philosopher's Forum where people could come in and, you know, it's an intellectual hothouse in Chelsea. People would come in and we would pick a theme and the crowd would choose what they wanted to discuss. I would just facilitate and we would have public discussions of things you couldn't talk about on campus even back then. So mm. that's informal, but we also have formal methods and we're able to work with groups and organizations. So we do consulting. You can work with a with a with a Fortune 500 company and, and some do. You can work with governments. You can work with leaders. You can work bringing philosophy into all kinds of environments where people can benefit from a philosophical perspective. So it's not limited to counseling, although counseling gets most of the media play. You know, so shifting into the other uh, topic then you mentioned that you know there's there's a lot of new engagement with this in China, India, Brazil, other places as well. And one of the peculiarities that we do find about the American educational and I won't even call it a system because it's just a patchwork of you know a whole bunch of different systems is that we generally don't do much if anything, with philosophy in K through 12 education. And then, you know, college students might take an intro class or an ethics class to satisfy some gen ed requirements. Whereas in, you know, not just in Europe, which is, I think, a lot of people's first thought, but if you're, if you're doing any sustained getting you ready for university education, in most countries, you're going to study some philosophy. And it might not be great, right? Because, you know, uh, who, whose experience is perfect across the board in education, but you're certainly going to have an understanding that philosophy is something that matters. And I think perhaps also that the ordinary person could relate to it. Whereas here in the States, it's often viewed as this like, you know, elitist, abstruse activity. So in in the all these other countries, is it an easier sell, you think, than, I mean, and you've been one of the people like carrying out the sell for, for decades and decades. Is it an easier sell in Europe, in China, in India, uh, even Brazil, uh, than it is here in, in the U.S. to get people to say, yeah, philosophy could actually help me with my life problems. I don't know much about this thing they're calling philosophy, other than there was this Socrates guy, and you know he had a student named Plato, and uh, there was this other guy named Aristotle, and look, there's a, a, a famous painting where all these guys are lined up together. <laughs> you know, um, is, is it a harder sell here in the States? Oh, no question. <laughs> it's a, interesting. It's a really hard sell in this. Although, isn't it curious? And I want to present this to you as a kind of paradox. 
And okay. One, one element of your analysis also is 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 missing. Let's let's put that on the table. Terror. I know any number of people who avoided philosophy at all costs in university <laughs> because they didn't a they didn't have to take it. The core, as you imply, had been dissolved and yep. replaced with gen ed distribution, so people didn't have to take a philosophy course. The reputation that philosophy has is that it's certainly the most difficult among the humanities courses mm -hmm. if you're going to do it rigorously. And people would say, well, take the line of least resistance why wouldn't i take a more fun and easy course for my uh, you know gen ed requirements why would i su subject myself to having to think one of the most laudatory comments i ever received on a student evaluation is that the student wrote and i mean this is the innocence and beauty of it the student wrote you know this course was so interesting the professor actually made me think after the bell had rung and i guess so there's <laughs> There, there's no greater compliment, I contend, that could be paid to a professor than the student says, gee, I even kept thinking after the bell had rung. You know, what is this, Pavlovian? We, we, you know, the bell rings, everybody shuts their brain down. The serious point, Greg, is yeah. that that um, it's partly historical. Uh, the, let's say, the predominance of analytic philosophy uh, removed it from uh, public interests uh, and and from public accessibility. Yeah, uh, yeah. Philosophers are preoccupied with a number of problems that interest primarily analytic philosophers, and the public could not get any handle on why people were doing this and why did it matter. So that basically already put philosophy into a difficult situation. And then there was the expectation, I think, on the part of analytic philosophers that somehow the world owed them a living because they were doing this. Yeah. And that's obviously not the case. Nobody foresaw defunding of humanities. Nobody foresaw all the other things that nobody can foresee. And either the world's moving towards you or away from you, my friend. You've got to realize where you are on a given day. Locality is, you know, is, is malleable. And I think that analytic philosophy basically began to wither on the vine because it was attracting people, unlike present company, who who basically aren't interested in applications. And that's fine. The university has two main dimensions of every single discipline, pure and applied. Mm. I don't care whether it's science or humanities. You could do theoretical science or experimental science. You could do pure math or applied math. Yes, you you could do even theoretical biology. There are journals of theory, or you could right, obviously right. do the experimental stuff. Every science has pure and applied. And the humanities, you could study uh, literary theory or creative writing. You could study music composition or performance. It's all pure and applied. Every Why does philosophy the exception? Why did we say, no, 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 there are no applications. It's only We're only brains and bats. And well, we're training more brains and bats. And yeah. this is not going to help anybody outside of the brains and bats who obviously find it engaging and publish important work that only brains and bats will read. So yeah. I think that we did it to ourselves. It was colossal shooting of oneself in the foot. So that leads me to something else I'd wanted to ask you about. Um, you know, we've got this, let's say, pretty well organized um, movement um, of philosophical counseling slash philosophical practice going on. And, you know, there's possibilities for study and accreditation and, and engaging with colleagues. There's journals and things like that. And then there's other, um, let's call them movements or, or perspectives on philosophy that that overlap to some degree, but they're not exactly the same. And I have in mind the emphasis, uh, recent emphasis on doing public philosophy, which you do see some departments paying more attention to, and there are organizations out there trying to foster. And then there's this whole idea of philosophy as a way of life, which, you know, great catchphrase that Pierre Adot coined, but has been around for a very long time. And it seems to me like there's significant overlap between philosophical counseling and philosophy as a way of life, you know, and it's, you do study philosophy historically with both of them so that you could, but it's, it's for application. So when we read Seneca, we're not just saying, all right, who were his influences? You know, who, who was reading this stuff? What, what's the background? We're saying, all right, um, what would happen to your life if you actually put this into practice? Would this be good for you? Would this be bad for you? We, we do have to do some terminological clarification. What the hell does he mean by this, right? Because, uh, you know, uh, that's, we're, we're pretty good at, at doing that sort of thing. Um, but it seems to me like 
you know, we, we do have intersects, but these are not identical to each other. So philosophical practice, philosophical counseling isn't exactly the same thing as public philosophy, but they're going to nurture each other or philosophy understood and practiced as a way of life doesn't necessarily have to be philosophical counseling, but it sure, sure wouldn't hurt it, you know, to, to have some intersect there. So what's, do you, do you see these as like separate things that do connect with each other or am I, am I misstating it? Are they really all within the same sphere? Yeah, I think they are. If you look at it through the public philosophy lens, we're part okay. of that. We're certainly part of that because we're taking philosophy in a way out of the classroom into the private sector, into the public sector. Uh, and we do philosophy with NGOs and with all kinds of organizations. So it's definitely very public. Now, the other point is, and I want to come back to something that you mentioned earlier uh, about the contrast between the USA and the EU. Mm. Uh, you know, and why there people are better educated philosophically. You know, at City College, we have 150 plus countries represented. Yeah. And, and any number of times when we had philosophy as a compulsory component of our core, our liberal arts core, I had, you know, as chair very often to grant exemptions to European students who would come in. Oh, it would say uh, this this mandatory intro to philosophy. We did this in high school. Yeah. In yeah. Asia. yeah. OK, we did this in high school in Romania. We did this in high school in, you know, Scandinavia. Why should I have to do it over? And then I'd say, you know, well, OK, show me your show me the syllabus. Show me what you read. Tell me. And they would. And they, yeah, it's equivalent to our 101. So fine. But they got it in high school. Why? Well, Europeans, I think, are and in a very general way, you know, that the U.S. has always had traditionally the world leading educations, you know, in terms of our very best, which are maybe not so great in a lot of ways anymore. Yeah. But traditionally, you know, before all the scandals started to hit, <laughs> um, we were the envy of the world. But our public education, we have a huge divide between public and private. So our public education was not as good as the public education in Europe, arguably, on average. And what that what that indicated, I think, is an historical trend. I think that Europeans um, are just more philosophically oriented as part of their longstanding cultural ethos. You know, the UK is, although it when it was an empire, it identified with Rome, and I've even seen commercials in Latin, you know, the 20th century. Yeah, yeah. A strong identification with the Roman Empire, but really they're much more like Greece. And Europe is much more like Greece in terms of the prol proliferation of philosophical schools and public consciousness of philosophy. Whereas America is much more like Rome. What do Americans want? The Super Bowl, bread and circuses on a huge, unprecedented scale. Well, that's what we've done. We've yeah, done yeah. what Rome has done in spades. But how many great philosophers came out of Rome? Excuse me, you can count them on the fingers of one hand. Whereas in ancient Greece, you in Athens, you had a philosopher on, on every street corner with some school or other. And you know, I think Europe is heir to that more than we you, are. You, I mean, you could say, well, you know, what about all these different, you know, philosophers writing in Latin? And and Cicero is is a great, you know, exception to that. But a lot of Cicero's project was to take Greek philosophy, which he'd not studied in Rome, he studied in Rhodes and in Athens and bring it back and put it into Latin. And I was just thinking, well, what about Seneca? Well, Seneca didn't come from Rome. Seneca's a Spaniard, you know? And there's all there's all these people who flocked to Rome before they kicked the philosophers out. I mean, there were a couple Roman emperors who were like, yeah, these guys are trouble. Get the hell out of here. That's why Epictetus and Plutarch had to relocate, you know, Seneca, uh, because because people wanted to be himself. in Rome. Seneca had to kill himself in the end. Yeah, yeah. So, so I th I think that yeah, there's there's a good contrast there, and it's interesting too because you have you have places that are power centers, and they suck talent into them, right? They don't necessarily generate the talent themselves, and we might get a a somewhat mistaken impression if we're only looking at where somebody did work. I mean, take, take, take the CUNY Grad Center, right? So how many of your peers and colleagues are from New York City and came up through the CUNY system who are teaching there? You know, it's a very, you know, renowned institution, um, but it, it drew its talent from elsewhere, right? Of course. And I saw this, I was a graduate student in England at University College London, I lived in London for three years during the 80s. 
And even then, it was clear that most people I met in London were not Londoners. You know, it was very fair to meet a Londoner. And particularly in the university system, most people were attracted to it by the potential it gave them, the platform it gave them. Then they could return to their home country and build on it. So it was natural, as you say, that power centers of culture and ultimately of, of wealth, but I mean also cultural wealth and power, are going to attract people. Seneca was from the middle classes. They didn't even exist. Right. In Hispania, he was yeah. what we would today call middle class. He had a talent as a scribe. He knew how to read and write. And he went to Rome. He wasn't. He didn't immediately get into Nero's employ. He was spotted as a talent. You know, he rose through the through the ranks of, of public scribes, and eventually Nero's mother hired him. And uh, as you say, but he he suffered the you know the 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 all of yeah. The, Nero wasn't a good guy to work for. That's well, for sure. yeah. I mean, you know, <laughs> when you're working for Nero, can be careful. But basically, uh, he he made uh, himself into a, a an historic figure, I guess, by having the innate talents and the opportunities that he was able to capitalize on. But he was a he served humanity in a certain way. He didn't do philosophy to enrich himself. I think he really wanted to leave us with important legacies. So it's back to what you said. The study of philosophy in a, in an ac strictly academic sense can be the study of the history of ideas. After all, we're all having debates with Plato and Rousseau and Marx and whoever we wanted to be. You know, we carry this on in our head over centuries, right? We yeah. write papers. We're debating these guys. They're not dead. Their ideas live on. So we're we're really concerned with the history of ideas and the evolution of thought. That's the theoretical side. But as you quoted Hado and rightly, <clears throat> most people out there need to earn a living and they're not going to earn a living from the history of ideas. But the right yeah, idea at the right yeah. time can be absolutely vital to their own well-being and flourishing. So philosophers can plug them in to ideas that really matter. T subtitle of your of your show. You know that's that's an interesting point because um, so you know, let's take business, which is probably you know one of the areas that Americans tend to respect the most, right? In just sort of a almost superstitious way. Um, there's a lot of business people who do see some value in philosophical ideas and, you know, they, they'll read a book or something, you know, um, and they, oftentimes it's not going straight to Plato or Epictetus or pick whoever else you want. It's, you know, some sort of digested thing. And that would be better for them than not reading anything at all, right? So they may get some ideas that they can do something with and, the, the trouble is, is that, you know, very often ideas aren't by themselves automatically going to tell you how to apply them correctly. You, you need you need more than one idea to make an idea work, you could say. Right. And the, the more of them you've got, maybe the better off you are. And so, you know, what is what does philosophy afford us that then we can bring to them uh, as practitioners? Well, you know, we spend a lot of time with, you know, so, for example, I do a lot of anger management work, and I, I may have mentioned this before in one of our conversations. If I'm dealing with business people, they don't want to know the ideas come from Aristotle or Epictetus or Thomas Aquinas right away because they don't care. <laughs> they just want to know that the stuff works. So I present them with, you know, say Aristotle's discussions about, you know, what what good anger would actually look like and how rare that actually is, and what you would need in order to like, you know, make sure that you're not just justifying your your outbursts or something like that. And then after they've practiced it, they come to you and they're like, hey, this is great stuff. Did you come up with this? And you're like, no, no, this has been around for, you know, 20, 2,400 years, 2,300 years. Um, and, you know, here's where you can find out more about it. And then they're usually much more amenable to it. And as you were talking about, like, having the right idea at the right time, you know, in order to be able to have the right idea at the right time, you can't just have read a, you know, one Aristotle quote per day calendar or something like that. You need to, I mean, either you need to have studied it yourself or you need somebody in your your corner, so to speak, who's done that that work and then can, can help you out with that. Um, and, you know, I think we could say this for, for many other things. So maybe that's one explanation because you know, people are often like, well, what am I going to get out of this? You know, what is this going to give me? And saying, well, you might come up with something that'll be useful to you one day. I don't think that's a very persuasive. And you're not uh, going to sell you're not going to sell that. 
uh, we're <laughs> talking about, let me give you a, a, a new one, maybe a, a more nuanced perspective on business because I've done a lot sure. of, you know, with business leaders over the years. And what you're saying is absolutely true. They, they don't want a job jar, like pick the quote of the week out of a job jar or, you know, anecdote jar. Yeah, yeah. No, 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 no. They need a takeaway that they can immediately use to work on their problems. So first of all, what people need to understand, there are really two things in play or maybe three. So I'll quickly just list them. Okay. First of all, okay. what you said is absolutely true. It's just not like, here's an idea, see if you can use it. What I've discovered empirically <laughs> in my practice is that people who are thoughtful and many business people are very intelligent and thoughtful, by the way, you know, brilliant. Yeah. Uh, they just do business. I have met CEOs who want to be philosophers in their next lives because they suddenly realize the one thing that we have that they don't have is time for reflection. We are so mm. fortunate to be able to have time to get up in the morning and think about something carefully. And they don't, they're overworked. Right, they're right. overtasked. They're worried about the quarterly report. How far ahead can they really look anyway? Even if they see something down the road, the quarterly report is what drives them. And so they're really constrained in a lot of ways and pressured. It's not an easy life by any means. And they have huge responsibilities. So my point is this intelligent people, whether they're CEOs or whether they're in any job, in any profession at all, will reinvent important fragments of certain philosophers. It's not that That's they right. write yeah, them. Yeah. They have, you know, I'm a bit of a Platonist. I think that people innately can certainly have the capacity to reinvent an insight that they didn't know someone wrote at length about, or maybe several philosophers wrote at length about. So when they're informed, and now it's a philosophical counselor who can say, you know, you sound a lot like Aristotle here or like Nietzsche or whomever. And then yeah, they're yeah. suddenly able to locate themselves, Greg. They they can suddenly rediscover or discover a philosophical identity they did not know they had. And they can locate themselves on this great map of the history of ideas and see what do school you, they're in. Do you think that... Um it's not just sort of a cognitive or informational thing, this being able to lo locate yourself, um, but also it, it plays some sort of emotional or affective role as well. Because I've had clients where when I tell them things like that, they're like, oh, well, that's, that's, you know, very interesting. Um, and some, you can, you can see a sense of relief. Like I'm not crazy. Uh, somebody else has had these ideas you know, and it's sort of like the other thing where one of the most liberatory phrases that I've come across with a lot of people in, in philosophical counseling is when you tell them, you know, the problem that you're facing is not that unique to you. And you see this like, you know, visible change, a sort of relief that washes over them. <clears throat> so does, does this, is there a function to this being able to locate yourself that yes. we need? You just nailed it. I mean, that, that's another thing. I have two more, two more little points to make about what we're still on. But yeah, what people, what everybody tends to do, because our culture reinforces it, our diagnostic, therapeutic, psychologized, over-medicalized culture does this. I'm talking not about the leading edge of medicine, which I love and probably I'm still alive because of, but I'm talking about the medicalization of human problems that have no business being medicalized. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so what people yeah. do partly because I guess of self-preservative instincts and also because of the cultural norms is that they particularize, they're constantly obsessing about their own particulars and they build a cage and they don't know how to get out of it. And when philosophers do the opposite, we leap to universal. Yeah, yeah. But it's this universe. There's nothing special about you. No, but but, but yeah. when it's said the right way, when, yeah, yeah. When, it's, when it's broached with someone in a compassionate way and an intelligent way, they say, well, yeah, that, that's true. Everyone else is, is, you know, is dealing with, or this, you know, there's a lot of problems that are shared. And so there's a community, uh, so the problem is not particular. The problem could become a cultural one. It could become a social one, it could become obviously a political one. But when people stop individualizing and start identifying with l things that are larger than themselves, then they can escape from that obsessive narcissistic cage. And this that, that tendency is getting worse and worse. So we can help in that way. But there's two other things going on. I think that one has to have, in order to be, let's say, uh, 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 to to benefit from a philosophical intervention, yeah, yeah, one has to one has to appreciate reflectiveness 
And mm. uh, a lot of people are impulsive and don't really want to be reflective. A lot of people are still in the U.S. were notoriously materialistic, right? Obviously, the bottom line here is still the dollar. Yeah. So that what I see empirically, Greg, is that Plato, not Prozac, was marketed by some very smart women in New York who run the publishing industry. Okay, very smart. Yeah, I didn't. I was just the front man. They they figured this whole thing out, and then they, and it went into twenty seven languages. So they understood that there was a nerve that was going to be tapped by this. I didn't. They did. Yeah, it gave them the content. Right. They they built the whole other thing from their understanding of the world. But it really is a book that was meant to appeal to the high end of the self-help market. The single biggest segment of publishing in this country is self-help. Oh, is it really? Yes. Bigger than biography, bigger than... Than everything. Interesting. Bigger than everything. And people need more self-help than ever because everything around them is deconstructed. The foundations of our civilization are crumbling around us as we speak. And yeah. uh, I mean, it started in my view, and this is not a pejorative comment, it's just an observation that postmodernism deconstructed all the grand narratives that people had been given a place in the universe by. You know, the, the Elizabethan chain of being was not a bad thing. The feudal system did not permit too much mobility. I get it. Socioeconomic mobility yeah, yeah. was only ushered mm -hmm. in by progressive social and political change. Sure. But in the great worldview of the Elizabethan picture, everyone had a place. Everyone belonged somewhere. And in the Confucian picture of China, same thing. And in India, you right. know, the caste yeah. system is not great for many reasons, but Everybody has a place. Everybody belongs. And in the West, what we've done with our overemphasis on everybody being equal means everyone's supposed to be the same. No one's supposed to have anything meaningful in their lives. And all the grand narratives are deconstructed. So we have a meaning crisis, which is a huge uh, existential crisis, which is partly being ginned up by, by catastrophic media. You know, the catastrophization that goes on yeah. daily to scare people, to terrorize people without any evidence behind it. People are floundering and sometimes without good reason. So self-help is more important now than it was 20 years ago. But when Plato Not Prozac came out, it was billed as self-help, but philosophical self-help. And it, ironically, it ended up in the psychology. It ended up in self-help or psychology. Many bookstores, okay. when there were bookstores, it would, you would find it in the psychology section, right? Well, it's probably going to get bought more and looked at more than if it's in the philosophy section, you know, so the tail wags the dog in, in those yeah. days. Now it's a different model pre 2008, but the pre 2008 model before the collapse, which really devastated the publishing industry too. But, but, you know, the tail was wagging the dog because a publisher would say they'd look at a book and I can, I can give you examples of books that were never published because the publisher said, this is a great book, but where are they going to shelve it? Oh, interesting. Yeah, where's, yeah. where's Barnes and Noble going to say the whole thing has been predefined and yeah. God help you. You write a book that doesn't fit neatly into one of their predefined categories. They're mentally constipated. They can only think about this, that, or the other. Everything is siloed, like our institutions, not a I, You know, I have friends who write uh, fiction and they're finding similar things. You know, if you can't neatly put it into fantasy or horror or science fiction or romance or pick whatever else you want then you're you really have a hard time getting somebody to publish your what book. box are you in my friend exactly what yeah. box are you're gonna have to stay in and if you want to get out of that box we're not going to let you because our bread and butter comes from you being in that box and hollywood tells this story over and over again there are great actors who got pigeonholed right? Playing certain kinds of roles. And they may have had enormous talent and could have played other kinds of roles. That's but right, pigeonholing yeah. is what silos them. And then you build up this relationship of expectation that their name is associated with a certain genre. And they're yeah. simply not allowed to break out of it unless they want to take a huge risk. Yes? You know, that, that, that raises an interesting question about, um, let's call it, not just Hollywood, but American media in general and, and philosophy. And we're saying that, you know, we we don't get introduced to philosophy unless we're extraordinarily lucky. Like I had two philosophy classes uh, in, in high school. Both One was an actual intro to philosophy class. One was a religion class that the instructor who was only there for a semester as a sub 
switched into a, a philosophy class and the the actual philosophy class was actually was quite bad and then the other one was was quite good but that, that was such an exception and i was thinking as you're talking about hollywood so how often do we actually get depictions of anybody doing philosophy that look remotely like what you know being a philosophy professor or doing practice or anything like that would would be like, and you know, as opposed to somebody in some stuffy classroom with a tweed jacket putting stuff on the board about the meaning of being or something like that. And we could com similarly complain about English and history and mathematics. They, you know, they get all of that wrong as well. You know, and if we think about TV, okay, maybe there's a little bit more. There was that show, The Good Place, where they had a, a guy who was actually explaining ethics, but doing so in kind of a I don't know, a Hollywoodish way, you know? So people could get a little slice of, of that. And, you know, so we've got sort of a self-reinforcing thing. We're not, we're not getting philosophy much in K through 12 or in college either. And then the dominant culture doesn't really, there's not a lot of space in, in uh, film, in TV, in, in other things that people are, watching and, and and listening to um except you know very smaller independent things you know i mean we've got youtube channels we've got podcasts we've got things like that um but you know, americans just don't get a lot of exposure to philosophy in either of these these two venues you know well yeah but th this once again it, it's about marketing and you can't okay you can't market philosophy as philosophy because people are scared of it too many syllables i will tell you a backstory plato not prozac was i'm pleased for your reader for your audience and your readers yeah yeah check out my other books because some of them are probably worth reading i mean Plato not prozac, yeah definitely yeah you know i mean i would like to think so but actually I, it, before you go into it if you had to plug just one of them as like your favorite one oh yeah which one would it be you know, fernando beethoven of the guitar it's my okay my into historical fiction you know i'm a classical guitarist and uh and he had an incredible life he really he had an unbelievable life and i romanticized it uh so so it's my favorite book at the moment uh, of the okay. ones that i've managed to publish okay and it's got nothing but it's also got philosophy embedded in it because he lived during the napoleonic upheaval and he 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 was a friend of goya's you know this great artist this colossus the last great master and the first modernist who was patronized by the notorious uh, duchess of alba well fernando was patronized by her at the same time he lived in her lyria palace and met goya and they became like brothers and then later on his european tours you know i have him in conversation with van goethe uh, van goethe mm. and with some of the leading humanists based yeah, yeah himself very very famous for his humanism you remember he tore up he defaced the score of his third symphony he had written it for napoleon and then when napoleon crowned himself as emperor uh, beethoven flew into a rage historically because he said well this guy is he's no longer a humanist this is not the ideals of the you french know, revolution this guy is now a despot and he so he, he tore up the de the dedication so there was there was a humanistic movement yeah. An enlightenment and post enlightenment movement that coursed all the way through that century. And Fernando was part of that too. So there's philosophy in the book, but it's not called philosophy. So it's, well, you know, friendly. again, be, uh, at the risk of leading us too far astray, because I do want to hear what you, what you have to say about the, the you know, uh, Hollywood and, and, uh, yeah, uh, academic thing. Um, so I think something that a lot of people don't know, and it's in part because of how philosophy has been presented to them. And I think that you're right that the analytic philosophy has been one of the big drivers for this in America. Um, they don't typically realize that when people were being called philosophers, that wasn't a narrow thing. I mean, um, and, and people who we look at and we pigeonhole as, oh, well, that person's just a musician. They read philosophy. They, they were interested in that. They were also interested in history or in rhetoric or, or things like that. And so, you know, really up until you could say the mid 20th century, the idea of, of somebody specializing narrowly in philosophy and the discipline just being about just this stuff was kind of foreign, you know, um, people could be called philosophers, but it was rare that that was all they did, you know. Well, of course. And I mean, John Dewey wrote wrote about this. in 19 Right, right. Yeah. 
1917, he said the problems of the world will, 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 will be not solved, but will be closer to at least to some, some kind of uh, uh, amelioration when philosophers stop worrying about the problems of philosophy and start worrying about the problems of humanity. So he was an early yeah. advocate of this call. And so, so, was, uh, so was Mortimer Adler, very famously, who right, in, right. His, in his book, he, he, he said philosophy is now engaged in sui he i'm quoting him suicidal epistemologizing he said there's we have to stop being moles burrowing each one burrowing into its own hole yeah yeah and 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 come back into the public realm but what i wanted to tell you was just this little backstory to illustrate exactly oh, right, right. the point you're yeah. making so um played on prozac was fine in hardcover it sold out the hardcovers and then they went to paperback which they do and the subtitle of the hardcover, by the way, is Applying Philosophy to Everyday Problems, which is exactly what the book does, based on my case studies, right, with all kinds of clients. The one morning before the paperback came out, it was in production, I get this call from the editor at HarperCollins. I mean, HarperCollins is a great house, you know, and, and the editor is a very, very astute guy. I think he's still there. I won't mention names, but he called me up at home one morning and he said, Lou, we're having a problem. I said, what, what's the problem? He said, well, the subtitle, he said, you know, Plato, not Prozac. Yes. And, and but applying philosophy to everyday problems, he said, this word philosophy, he said, this is there we go. We've been talking about this since since the show started. He yeah. said, it's going to scare too many syllables. It's going to scare off a lot of potential readers. Can you think of a, of a more user friendly subtitle? And, and he was very sheepish because he knew better also. But we're yeah. talking about marketing. What is going to sell? Philosophy doesn't sell. OK, it's part of the, you know, the youth of philosophy is good for you. So therefore, no one's interested in it. Right there. They'd be interested in it if they liked it, <laughs> but not because it's good for them. Yeah, so, yeah. Ended up, I thought about this. I racked my brains and listen, you're in the process. So you have to play ball uh, because this is the USA. If you want to eat, you 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 have to you have to work. And, you know, if you want to sell books, they have to be sellable. So I said to him after some thought, well, how about applying eternal wisdom to everyday problems? And he said, yeah. That's great. That's not scary. Eternal. Okay. It means it doesn't expire. Okay. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Good. And wisdom. No one's opposed to that. That all, that sounds like a very good thing. Everyone is wise in their own conceit. So fine. And that's the subtitle. If you look at the paperback, you know, since 1999, 2000, right. That that's the paperback, but it doesn't have the word philosophy in it because that would be too scary, but it's a book about philosophy for everyday life. So th this is marketing, my friend, you know, yeah, yeah. It's, that's the, that's the, reality. Well, you know, it's interesting that you bring that up because, um, I, you know, I mentioned I'm a big fan of Cicero. I'm also a big fan of Aristotle. And one thing both of those guys have in common is criticizing some of their fellow philosophers for not attending adequately to, uh, to rhetoric. And, you know, we often view rhetoric as, as, you know, we, it's a, it's a bad word. If somebody's using rhetoric, they're trying to, trying to trick you. And, you know, Aristotle in the, in the Art of Rhetoric, he says everybody needs to, to know about this because not only do you need, need it for self-defense so you can tell when somebody's trying to put one over on you, but you have to be able to present something. And in, in book three, he goes so far as to say all teaching involves persuasion. So, you know, you, you know, also medicine, getting people to take their pills and things like that. But but even in the classroom, we're trying to we're trying to sell. We're trying to convince these students that you know, the stuff we're putting on the board or asking them to read or talking about has anything of, of value to them. And then I think Cicero is even better for this. He starts his book, The Stoic Paradoxes, by saying, hey, I love you Stoic guys. You know, it, by the way, I'm not a Stoic, but if, if I wasn't an academic, I'd, I'd be with you. But you guys suck at being able to explain yourselves to people. You think that providing syllogisms is to like win people over. You need a little bit of like what you're calling marketing here, which, you know, back in ancient times, they, they just called rhetoric or, or persuasion. And I mean, for me, and I'd be interested to hear about your, your sort of like life background on this. So for me, coming from a non-academic family background where a lot of my parents' generation were in the trades and actually at least half of my generation are as well, <clears throat> you know, and not going to any, any particularly um, elite schools, 
I, I've always had the freedom to think, well, you know, the reason why we'd study philosophy is that it, it, we, we would do something with it. You know, it's not, I wasn't aspiring to become somebody who would be in a nice position and just get to like, you know, opine lofty thoughts all day long. I, I you know, if I was studying Nietzsche, I want to know what, what, what do you do with this stuff? Right. Even with studying analytic philosophy, I would be like, okay, so great. You know, um, I got really interested in the foundations of logic. Where would we actually apply this, this kind of thing, you know? And so for me, it was kind of a no brainer, but I think for a lot of uh, people in the discipline, that's, that's not really the case. You know, it's, it's a harder, they're, they're, they're resistant to the idea of marketing. They're resistant to the idea that you would actually consider your audience and tailor your message to them. They view it as pandering or uh, what are the other words, um, you know, uh, oversimplifying or, uh, you know, all the, all the, lingo sure. that well, do you take your whiskey neat or do you take it with water? I mean, <laughs> everyone has a taste, right? And yeah, I, yeah. I prefer not to dilute. If it's unblended whiskey, I wouldn't even put an ice cube in it, let alone anything else. I like yeah. it great, but some people will prefer to mix it with something. It's still whiskey, so it's a sorority's paradox. I like that. I like that. Um, you know, yeah. if, you keep, if you keep watering down the whiskey, but there's still whiskey in there at the end of the day, right? So yeah, you're yeah. getting some whiskey, and arguably, if whiskey's good for you, it's better to get some whiskey than no whiskey. So you have to water down, and I don't mean it in a pejorative sense. You have to make it accessible to people based on their ability to comprehend it based on their preparation yeah. and if they would spend more time and be more studious then they're obviously their level goes up and then they can understand more and appreciate more but if you're going to try to do philosophy with someone who's never done it before then you're trying to awaken their inner philosopher to begin with you're trying to engage them now the thing with back to the business world and they need takeaways our students are seeing yeah philosophy as immensely useful we're flourishing at city college more than ever because the world is so messed up in so many ways that suddenly the philosophers have now a stake as we always have had in the human condition and students are gravitating to us because wait a minute these guys aren't giving us yeah. answers, but they're asking all the questions that nobody else wants to ask and this is a positive thing for our students they can see how some of the takeaways, be they from Cicero or Mill or anybody, Nietzsche's perennial. Yeah, yeah. But they can see how it immediately applies to their lives. They don't have to read our books to see that. They get it in the classroom now. At least they get it from me and from Massimo and from some of our other active philosophers. You know, we have a very good department. So students are gravitating to it because it's meaningful for them in an age of meaninglessness. And we don't have to sell that at all. Now, that's interesting. Um if I were a university administrator, the metric I would be looking at, which is probably the wrong metric for that, is how many majors do you have, right? Because that's what they love. Or how many majors and minors, we could say, right? Um, but that doesn't really reveal to us the, the importance and the penetration of philosophy into the other disciplines at all. You know, um, I mean, in part, what we really want are business or fashion or nursing or pick whatever else majors who take philosophy classes. Five years down the line, they're still using some of those ideas that could be helpful for them. And maybe they're also reading some stuff along the way and they're they're doing things in their workplace with it and, and their lives. Um, I mean, it's great that we have philosophy majors, right? It's great that we have people who do want to specialize in, in that. It's probably better if they double major, frankly. Absolutely. Um, you know, there's all kinds of advantages. And the Wall Street Journal periodically publishes articles reminding people that a yes. philosophy major <laughs> or even a philosophy minor is why. Because what, what do we really learn in philosophy aside from the history of ideas we learn how to read write and reason and these yeah. skills can no longer be taken for granted in our culture which is in free fall so basically a lot of organizations have communications problems because people can no longer read write and reason That's so they right, can't yeah. communicate with each other so the organization lacks cohesion it lacks alignment it lacks clearness clarity on a day-to-day -day basis and philosophy majors have all that stuff they they can get entry levels into all kinds of professions also there's a lot of cachet in uh highly competitive 
you know, admissions into like law schools or medical schools or other such professional schools where a philosophy, even a minor in philosophy, along with the other prerequisites, mm. will be absolutely a leg up on the competition. So philosophy has not necessarily perceived intrinsic value, but perceived extrinsic value in terms of being able to leverage someone someone's advantage. Yeah. In another arena. But the but you know that's that's all part of it. But I want to say that that in consulting and facilitation work outside mm. the counseling room, <laughs> if I'm doing work with an organization. There are actually robust methods, Greg, that we can bring in and work with a small group of people on a real dilemma that the organization is having. I could give you examples, but there are real moral dilemmas every day of the week. And oh, right. It, yeah, in yeah. The, case, the CEO would call in the lawyers. You know, they want to solve a moral dilemma. They call in the lawyers. How can we do this? <laughs> And if they, yeah, can, yeah. you know, and I know, but your viewers need to know that just because something is legal doesn't make it morally justifiable, right? So basically, they're starting to realize that they also need tools. Sometimes now they have to call in the philosopher, not to give them the answer, not to commit the naturalistic fallacy and say this is right and that's wrong, but to give them a mechanism and a methodology whereby they can debate the question and arrive at their own answers as a team. This I is think a there's, really beautiful thing. I think there's also sort of a supportive function to having a philosopher in there because I've I've done some ethics consulting with organizations, and you know one of the things that I've seen from people who are often quite confident about their areas of technical expertise and perhaps even capacity to manage is. Uh, a kind of fearfulness, like, am I am I going to end up doing the wrong thing? Will people look at me as being unethical? And it, it steers them towards wanting fairly simple solutions. It's either right or it's wrong. You know, which, which lawyers, like you pointed out, are are great for answering, but giving you the wrong answers about in part. Um, and you know, em, empowering people to actually have dialogue about it, to, to engage with each other and say, well, I think this is right, but it's also wrong, making a distinction like that. In this way, it's right. In this way, it's wrong. Or here's why this is going to look bad, but it's not actually bad. It's actually the right thing to do. You know, when we are talking with them about that, you can see that they're not stupid people but they weren't able to think their way to that kind of resolution on their own. But, and maybe it's a, like a, a lack of confidence in ethical reasoning or something, cause they don't get a lot of practice in it, but you know, we, we do have that. And then we can say, Oh no, you're, you're on the right track or uh, you got it halfway, but you really should pay attention to the, to this. Um, I find that this affective dimension is often quite important in, in doing work with people, you know? Look, we have a lot of time pressure in our culture. People are multitasking. It's destroying, oh, yeah. Atten it's yeah, destroying yeah. attention span to begin with. Absolutely obliterating attention span. People have no time to reflect. They have no time even to think. And they tend to assume, because the culture has, again, imposed this idea on them, that every every question has a right and a wrong answer, and moral yeah, yeah. questions don't. And legal questions don't either. The law is, is quicksand. It's not going to always give you clarity. Yeah. It's going to give you an interpretation, depending on your particular bias. You know, it's also doxa at some point. But here's, here's what I'm trying to say, that we can create space for reflection, which people do not have the luxury of on a day-to-day -day basis anymore. And mm. it's something almost new to them, strange to say. So this is essentially important. It's also going back to what we said earlier about universalization and the benefits of understanding, oh yeah, my moral dilemma is really an age-old contest between, let us say, a utilitarian principle or consequentialist principle versus a deontological principle, and which one do I give priority to? And in the yeah. history of this debate, what reasons can I give for prioritizing one kind of school of moral philosophy over the other? It's a kind of situation ethics. But at least when people have a sense of the background and a sense of the complexity, they have a way also with our methodologies, they can actually work through things. You said a magic word, and the magic word is dialogue. And we okay. have the opposite of dialogue. You said that. And dialogue is is absolutely been eliminated from public debate. We have such polarization. Right, right. Culture. Yeah. It's only are you watching Fox or CNN? There's nothing else. There's no dialogue. They won't talk to each other. 
and they can't talk to each other because each one is firmly entrenched in, in, in it. So I'm not saying whether they're right or wrong. I'm merely saying in the absence of dialogue, yeah. there is no possibility of finding common ground. And if there's no possibility of finding common ground, then the differences get amplified and magnified, built into hostilities, because that's also marketed to people. The more we can gin up anger, then the more money we're going to make and to hell with what happens to the people. It's a great tragedy, actually. And dialogue is the resolution, not of the problems, but of yeah. the conflicts that ensue from different points of view. If people could be brought together and have a philosopher facilitating a dialogue, not dictating answers to them, facilitating a dialogue, pointing out in terms of rhetoric, where are their arguments sound, where are their arguments unsound, what has to be rethought and so forth. People can actually arrive at common understanding, even if the positions they begin with are quite disparate and opposed. So dialogue you is know, the magic word. So I'd like to shift this talking about dialogue into philosophical counseling itself, the one-on-one -on -one engagement with uh, clients who are struggling with you know various life issues. And I mean, one of the things that I, I gathered from uh, the, the training with you is that, well, there's a bunch of things I get there, but one of the things was that um, we're not approaching the client in this sort of like, we're up here, they're down here position. Um, I mean, some of them may actually come to looking for a guru or something like that, but that's not what a philosophical counselor is, is doing. And they're not saying, oh, it's all equal. All of our ideas are just, just as good as each other. I mean, obviously we're, we're bringing in ideas from philosophy because we think they could be a benefit to people and they, they don't know them yet. But there is a kind of parody, at least, that might be lacking in some older paradigms of psychotherapeutic counseling. I mean, think about the, the old fashioned psychoanalyst sitting behind the, the person, you know, who's lying on the couch, you know, not giving away anything of themselves. I mean, that's sort of a stereotype, but I think there are probably lots of cases like that. So uh, genuine dialogue in philosophical counseling is going to be central. And, you know, you've, you've, I, I'm guessing you've probably counseled at this point, not hundreds, but thousands of of people um, because you've been doing this for, for decades and decades. Well, just so, decades, just decades, huh? <laughs> only decades. So, um, you know, it's sort, sort of an open-ended question. Uh, what What is the relationship between the, the, the client and the practitioner in this case? It's not one of complete equality because we're not saying hey, uh, you know exactly as much as I do about philosophy, but you know it, it is a relationship of respect, you know, and it's not one where you get to just kind of boss them around or anything like that, right? So yes, it's, how it's does dialogue like, fit in there? It's a great question. It's more like uh, Nagarjuna's dialectic, if you like. It's, bo it's both equal and unequal. It's not Aristotelian. Okay. So it's non-Aristotelian. We have to be willing to enter into that non-Aristotelian space. Okay, I love Aristotle's logic, by the way, and we still teach it for good reason. But you, you're out, you've nailed it already. I'll just reiterate what you said, maybe in a, in a slightly different way. And that is when the client comes to a philosopher, sometimes they're worried. You know, I get emails from people who want sessions and, and they say, uh, well, do I have to study something before? I, like, do I have to study yeah. take a course or study philosophy or read something before I come and see you? I say, no, just bring your mind. That's fine. That's that's how, your mind is equal to the task of philosophizing. But people, again, are conditioned. I and, mean, you know, you can yeah. kind of relax them by saying, well, look, when you go talk to and this is the asymmetric part, the asymmetric part. So you say, well, when you go to a doctor, you don't need to go to medical school first to see your doctor. You don't, if you're going to talk to a lawyer, you don't need to go to law school to talk to a well, lawyer. It might help you, but you don't need to go to you don't need to go to law school. Why? Because these people have done that work and they've attained a certain benchmark of expertise, and you're trusting them. There's a fiduciary trust. There's a public trust in professions that are uh, regulated because they need to be to prevent harm to citizens. Yeah, yeah. But once they're regulated properly, if they're not corrupted. 
uh, and psychotherapy has been corrupted by big pharma. So that that's a different picture, right? But nonetheless, if you're going to a reputable professional, you want that person to know more about mm -hmm. certain things because you're depending on, on, on their insight, their advice. You know, I mean, is this, should I sign this contract? You know, you need someone to have eyes on it who is experienced in, in that way and therefore, you know, is highly trained in that way. So that's the asymmetric part. But then we're having a conversation. The big difference between philosophical counselors and licensed psychotherapists is that they have to make a diagnosis to get paid by third party insurers. Right. OK, so it's already the system is already gamed. All right. They're going to have to if they want money, uh, you know, then they're going to diagnose you. Now, they may not believe in it themselves. They're just going to hang a diagnosis on you in order to get the insurance. But excuse me, that stays with you. That's on your record. That's on your chart. That's right. Yeah, yeah. And, and a lot of people don't want that stigma uh, or a lot of people want the psychotherapy, but don't want the stigma. But this is the way the system is 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 gamed, basically, to force them to get diagnosed and then probably drugged because behind the diagnosis, there's always going to be some pill that you can take, Right. And in America, again, Mer Americans don't realize we're one of the few countries in the world that permits primetime television advertising of prescription oh, drugs. Right. Okay, yeah. Tell your doctor to give you this. And half the commercial is disclaimers if you wake up deaf, dumb, blind, <laughs> lame, halt, dead, stop taking it and call you. This is to protect themselves against, guess what, lawsuits. It's back to the money culture yeah. and, and all these licit drug pushers. You can't do this in Canada. I'm not saying Canada is utopia, not anymore. But I am saying that most civilized countries will not allow people to push drugs to, on people who have no idea whether they should take them or not. And doctors hate this because people will be swayed by the advertising. They'll go and ask their doctor for this. Excuse me, your doctor's qualified to know what you should be taking and what you shouldn't be not the advertisers who are making money from selling the product. That's corruption, okay? And we need more Ralph Nader's uh, to, to alert people to this. Yeah. You know that he called me up one morning because of no, this? Oh, re really? Yeah, it was, Interesting. Yeah, well, it was a few years back now, you know, but uh, one morning I went to my office at City College and I checked my voicemail and I had this message. said, this is Ralph Nader calling. Could you please give me a call back? And I wrote the number down. And I didn't notice it was a 201 number, okay? I mean, it's Washington. I didn't know. I just, you know, I get... So I thought it was some guy named Ralph Nader from Brooklyn. You know what? I didn't know who. So I phoned, I phoned <laughs> the number back. And I okay. got the secretary. And when I was phoning, I realized, wait a minute, this is Washington, D.C., right? So I said, this is Professor Marinoff returning Mr. Nader's call. She put him on the line. And I, I said to him right away, I said, you're I said, you're the Ralph Nader. I thought you were just some guy named Ralph Nader. So he laughed. And uh, what he wanted was a thousand copies of Plato, not Prozac for his library of civic. Oh, virtues. He, among other things, you know, you know that he disrupted the 2000 election. Oh, yeah. As an independent, he siphoned off enough votes. Yeah. from Gore, I believe, to actually tip the balance in Bush's favor. Of course, you had the hanging Chad thing in Florida. Yeah, yeah. I, I remember all of that. Yeah, Wait, I was a, I was in graduate school. Why don't we have normal school. elections yeah. in this country? Why is everything going to depend on something else instead of the... Anyway, I'm not going to get into that with you, but I mean, other... Like France, they have paper ballots. They count the vote one day. They got the result that well, night. This goes back to something I brought up a little bit earlier, which is... And I, I think... Um, almost everybody elsewhere, including even in Britain, do they just don't get this because they've often said it's very helpful for you to explain this. In America, we, because of our emphasis on um, local control of things as, as a good thing, which which was a good thing at certain times, yeah. we've got this like patchwork for for all sorts of things that really matter. So elections are one of them, you know, uh, each state sets its own election laws and does its own thing. And each county has its board that's doing things. And, you know, we do this for policing and criminal justice, and we do this for education and we do this for healthcare. And so there is no like system with a capital S that you can target and say, we're going to fix this. Right. And that's that's part of why it's uh, yeah, so when it works well, local control is great. But as soon as things start to go topsy turvy, you got all this corruption happening and, you know, uh, people don't have local control promises that people will actually have control within their own area. But very often you don't. You know, if you're in if you're in a state where 
they, you know, let's take the, Amer the Affordable Care Act, Obamacare, right? We, we were actually on that for a bit. And here in Wisconsin, there were different plans you could choose from. But you might live in, in a state where the way the state implemented it, there's only one provider and that's it. You know, and, you know, you'd be like, well, why is it this way in New York and this way in Colorado and this way in Wyoming? Eh, Because, it, it, you know, because Americans love things that way or, you know, take education. People are like, yeah, we need to reform higher ed. And you're like, well, what the hell is that? There's like, you know, if we're only thinking graduate school, there's 2000 different institutions, some of which are run by states, some of which are independent. And then if we're talking about undergraduates, there's even more thousands and nobody's in charge of all of them. And he's, well, and then people are like, well, what about the Department of Education? You're like, well, they don't do an awful lot. You know, they don't run things. But because, you know, in other places, there is there is a, a, a there is a buck stops here. We're running the thing sort of, uh, you know, take, take the, the Brits, right? There's a, a national police, right? And of course you can have local corruption, but then the, the top level people come down and, and, you know, crack down on them. Right. But we, we're, not a, we're not a democracy. We're a Republic and, and the founding fathers yeah. wisdom, they set it up this way. There's perpetual tension. There is no overarching authority really in these matters. E pluribus unum pluribus. Now, if you get rid of the un unum, that's part, the you got problem. A problem. Yeah. Then yeah. you got a yeah. problem. Because yeah, yeah. then you can have anarchy, which is, you know, where we're headed sometimes. But uh, it, it, it was at all costs meant to avoid dictatorship. Yeah, I think that was the main idea. And still yeah, and, and you see like somebody like Alexis de Tocqueville in Democracy in America, yeah. like highlighting this as, as something good for Americans. But one of the sort of like secret sauce elements that gets left out, because he was taking this from, from Mill and from Aristotle, is that when you, when you have local control, it affords the possibility for just about anybody to get in on the action and to develop themselves. You know, th this whole idea of you get to rule because you've been ruled yourself and you, you get to figure out how to do it. But there's no easy way to assure that in, in our current system, you know? And, and so people looking in from the outside often have this idea, well, we could easily fix things and there just aren't any, any fixes for these things anymore like policing or education no no across the board fixes I, you know? i'm very popperian about this and, and and i really do believe in that sense that you you can't do large-scale social engineering and make okay it yeah you know marx failed it when it went when they tried to do this with collectivization it was a disaster that's why china ultimately opened its economy to the world that's why the soviet empire collapsed i mean this is why centrally planned things don't often work because yeah. of this this inability <clears throat> that citizens have to be who they are in a good way. You know, if you give people opportunity, then from the grassroots, lots of wonderful things will spring up. And that's part of the success story of America. Yeah. And God bless mm -hmm. America for that reason. But we're living in more in more dangerous times now. So uh, there, there is a lot of corruption, unfortunately, which is everywhere in the world. But when corruption creeps into the things that give us most value as a nation and as individuals in our aspirations, uh, then, then that will foment discontents and all kinds of other problems. So definitely, that's why I mentioned earlier that the world, not because we want it to, but the world for a host of reasons is turning in the direction now where philosophy has more skin in the game, if you like. We have a bigger stake without ever having to do more than we've ever done. Suddenly, yeah. we have a bigger stake. And I want to just reinforce something you said earlier, and it's very important. You know, you said a lot of important things. <clears throat> This idea about being a philosopher doesn't mean that you're a brain in a vat. Historically, being a philosopher meant more generically, you were a person definitely who liked to read and write and think, yeah. yes, but you were also a person who was capable of engaging in the public sphere. You were a person who was capable of talking to people in the marketplace. You were a person who was capable of fulfilling other functions as a consultant or as a counselor or as somebody who provided useful skills, as well as being an educator. So why can't we just be philosophers? Why do why has the world gotten so twisted out of shape that we have to call ourselves philosophical practitioners or philosophical counselors or something exotic when actually that is more what the traditional role of philosophy always was? And it's only through recent peculiarities and siloings that the word philosopher has come to mean someone who is hermetically sealed off from society doing incomprehensible things that most students are afraid of. That's a very bad rap for us. 
And I, you know, I still do that and I love to do that. I have published papers that nobody understands except for a few people. And <laughs> yeah. and I publish it for those few people. And I yeah, yeah. and that's wonderful. And we should do that. But that can't be the whole. It's a myriological problem. It's a question of holes and parts. And yeah. people who are more holistic, Greg, and who want to do more things and diversify are still philosophers. And maybe that is really the meaning of philosophy that we need to recapture without diminishing the importance of specializations. So let me steer this in a different direction to a possible criticism of, of um, philosophical counseling, given, you know, like you said, we need philosophy more than ever because the world is kind of a mess and, uh, you know, all of that. Um, and you do see people making this, this criticism of philosophical counseling, philosophy as a way of life, uh, other similar things that it's essentially to help the individual not feel as bad about their crappy situation but then there's no there's no impact and i don't i don't mean like you have to have a national impact or something like that but it's not going to change how you deal with people in the workplace it's not going to make your workplace better you going to philosophical counseling or it's not going to make necessarily your neighborhood better or something like that oh i totally disagree that's well that so what <laughs> is the what is the 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 like argument we're say. talking about transformation of consciousness. I mean, ultimately, what we're talking about is a positive transformation, right? I mean, I'm not yeah. preaching ideology. I'm not preaching insurrection. I'm not preaching bloodshed. I'm not preaching any damn thing, actually, except that each human being has tremendous, a tremendous inner potential, which is usually not even close to fully activated, including present company. I mean, you could probably imagine, as I can, a hundred other things that we'd like to do if we had the time to do them in order to self-develop more, right? But most people are stuck one way or another because they've inherited baggage, you know, from yeah, the culture yeah. and they've inherited expectations from the culture and they're judged by the most impossibly narrow and shallow characteristics. I will rail against identity politics because it's utterly dehumanizing, does not recognize the individual value of any human being at all and judges people only by criteria that have nothing to do with their capacities. OK, so I would not I would never want to judge someone by their race, ethnicity, gender, religion, <laughs> or any other criterion. I want to know what's in your mind and what's in your heart and what philosophy can do, which nothing else does in this way, is to enable people to take what actions they can to transform their consciousness and therefore mm. their interpretation of what's going on and make it have a more positive rather than a more negative outcome. So Epictetus can, deal, can teach us how to take unwholesome circumstances and regard them as opportunities for transformation. Right, yeah. Okay, that has major traction, whether you're talking about domestic life or on-the-job life or your own you know, journey through life. If you're an artist and you want to be somehow more creative or more successful or more fulfilled, there are all kinds of philosophical insights that can similarly transform not what you do, but the way you look at what you do and the way you practice what you do that will enhance what you do at the end of the day. And that's what has value. And this is not psychology with all due respect. It's not what psychologists are trained to, to do with people, not lawyers, not doctors. We're doing yeah. something unique. And its value ha has been, I guess, ignored because people never saw it. What worries me, Greg, is that when philosophy becomes popular, it's because the world's in trouble and because people are now grasping at straws and we're one of the straws at which they grasp. But I think that if they're going to do that, they've grasped something really valuable. So, you, you know, as we kind of draw to a close, um, one of the things I wanted to ask you about, there's um, multiple... Uh, what would we call them? Institutions, organizations that that uh, do certification and training for philosophical counseling. The American Philosophical Practitioners Association is um, what what would we call it? Eclectic, uh, pluralistic. You know, when it, it, it's not as if you say, well, you have to work with Aristotle or you must take Socrates as your model, and that's. You know, you could have gone that way. You could have established a canon or something like that. Why didn't you? I mean, there is a risk of like saying, well, anything goes, but that's that's not the case. So how do you how do you manage to like, you know, you do want people to have a lot of different possibilities for who they're gonna draw on, but you know, how do you keep it within certain we bounds? Do what? We're we're more like a brand at this point. You know, okay. 
we're, we're 25 years old, more or less. And we, we started as an experiment and it's really a Hollywood kind of a motto, build it and they will come. Right. I mean, it's a, and we built it and they came. Uh, so we're just thrilled. I'm speaking now about the board of directors. I don't run this alone. I have, you know, as you know, we have a wonderful colleagues, wonderful practitioners from so many states and countries now, and they come to us and we don't demand that they study a particular philosopher. As you well know, we just want, and we're yeah, not yeah. accrediting, please note, we're not a credit. We don't have accrediting power. We have power of certification. It's not right. the same thing. Right. OK, we're not accredited because we're not regulated by states. And I think that's a good idea. I don't I'm not so sure that government should be in the business of regulating philosophy. That would probably be a disaster. So we're, we're happy to be operating as a 501c3 beholden to the IRS to make our annual report to them, you know. But basically, we are, uh, thank goodness for the First Amendment, not not beholden to anyone for policy. We believe in freedom of thought and freedom of expression strongly. So what attracts people to us is that we give them the tools to build a practice. And I think empirically, uh, for those who, who have already been practicing, what we offer in terms of our trainings, give people more tools than they had or allow them to enhance their existing practices. And for people who want to practice, aspiring young philosophers now see this as a viable opportunity, partly because jobs are scarce. You know, the humanities are being defunded. You love oh, ideas. Yeah. Yeah, Most yeah. people study philosophy because they love ideas, not money. They're holy fools. God bless them, you know, but we're not taking vows either. So it's yeah, a yeah. rope, right? We're holy fools who love ideas, but we're not ensconced in a, in a monastic order. So we didn't take vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience either. That's a tightrope in this society. And we help people to, you know, we give them the tools to walk that tightrope and build a practice. And we don't tell them what philosophers they have to use. That's up to them. And they will attract to themselves clients who basically resonate with them. And that's the beauty of what we do. Every encounter with a philosopher is different. There, there isn't a blueprint for doing this. So it's it gives the, the inquirer more responsibility as a human being not to be dictated to, not to fill up some check boxes, you know, yeah, and get yeah. diagnosed. But you're on a journey, my friend. You find your next guide. Your next guide is there, but maybe you have to find that person. And then you'll be, you know, you'll, you'll have company on that part of your journey and it will be illuminating for you and shine a light on your path going forward. That's all we do. But it provides a very valuable human service. So as we finish up, um, the APPA website is going through a major overhaul, lots more functionality, a lot, you know, better storefront, so to speak, on the internet. Um, and you mentioned these, you know, these interesting developments going on overseas in China, India, Turkey, Brazil, and all that. So um, what do you think, as somebody who can like, you know, it's got a really good view on this, this sort of thing, because you're so, you know, connected and, and you've got such a, a long background, um, you know, 30, 40, 50 years from now, where do you see philosophical counseling going and developing? Obviously, you know, huge changes just in the last 30 years. Right. Um, what do you think is going to be happening I, I don't have a crystal ball, so I can't, you know, I don't want to just yeah. you or your, re I, I mean, if you did, that would be really nice, but yeah. Well, don't we all, we all want that, you know, I mean, we know where to place bats, wouldn't we? But basically I don't gamble. So um, I don't really want a crystal ball. I don't want Gaiji's <laughs> ring either, particularly, yeah. uh, uh, you know, and, and, and on that list of things I really don't want would be a crystal ball, but basically looking at what we've achieved in the last quarter century and what and looking at the growth and what APA has done and you know not uniquely but one of the things we've done and I think successfully is to help to train pioneers in many different countries that's why people come to us they say ah okay. what you're doing ah we could do this in uh, you know, we can do this in <clears throat> Romania. We can do this in Hungary. We can do this in Croatia. We can do this in China, India, Brazil, Turkey, wherever. And they want to do it there. And they have the somehow the makeup. They have the education and the mission to want to do it. And what yeah, they're yeah. lacking only are the tools and they could figure it out for themselves. We can save them some time because we were the pioneers in our generation. So, you know, we have a toolkit that we hand off and explain how to use. So it's been empirically very successful. My accountant thinks uh, and he just he volunteered this a couple of years. Okay. I mean, he does our tax returns. Right. I mean, that's his scope of practice. He's, yeah, not, yes. he's not a fortune teller either. 
but he's been doing APPA stuff. He's seen it grow for 25 years. And he said, yeah, one day he just said to me, I didn't solicit this. He said, you know, you, you guys have built something really interesting here. And I think he said, this is 100, 200 years into the future. This is going to grow into something really, really interesting and and important. That was a very conservative, very parochial view, okay, of a very small, under the radar nonprofit. But that has a huge reach in spite of its lack of capital and market influence. Those sort of indices are really quite interesting. I mean, you might think about like how the the insurance industry, you know, when, when we talk about is global climate change taking place? Well, the insurance industry sure as hell believes so, right? Because they've got, you know, stake in whether uh, things are going to be underwater or not and whether they're going to pay money. So I, I kind of like these prognostications coming from outside of the discipline itself especially when they're coming from money people you know, so. yeah well people who yeah people who, who basically are very practical yes yeah yeah not speculative not not philosophical particularly but it goes back to plato we've been a shadow university for a long time and we still are a shadow university you could say we're taking up some of the slack okay that the universities have left uh, i and- think that's 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 right I, you know i've i've um said this in a number of venues when people ask me about public philosophy that um the popular culture is not doing a, a very good job at all when it comes to philosophy but the academic institutions not doing a great job in reaching the public either you know it's it's gotten locked up in in departments and so there's this huge middle ground of people who you know, as you, you've you called them, natural philosophers who don't realize that and are ready for whoever wants to go out there and, and work with them, you know. But uh, I don't know that a lot of people are um, happy to work with them. We certainly are. But well, yeah, but the thing is, it's all self-selecting at this stage. We're still innocent, all right? We're not corrupted okay. by government regulation or licensure. And we don't yeah, want yeah. To be, we may be corrupted by other things, but not that. So it's all people who want to be practitioners are self-selecting. They say, wait a second, I feel a calling to this. Or very often they're teachers of philosophy at some institution. And they say, you know, I'm the kind of person that students like to talk to after class or they like to come to my office hour and they want to expand upon something that happened in class and they want to apply it to their lives. And people are segueing right into philosophical counseling, you know, and they're known now they know that they're doing it and they say, well, okay, I want to formalize this a little bit more now. Yeah, yeah open a private practice so people have a calling philosophers some of them have a calling uh to do this and also the clients are self-selecting we we are not that's true we are not advertising california psychics are advertising on primetime tv (laughs) because they have the money i guess to do it and you know psychotherapists online like crazy you know they're off the charts with their advertising we don't we don't have that kind of money. And I, if we did, I'm not sure we'd even want to advertise. I think I like this self-selecting model. We're not trying yeah. to be in anybody's face. You have an interest. This is out there. If it if it's attractive to you, there's a whole bunch of really interesting philosophers that you could engage with. And as you say, our website makes it easier and easier to find people that you know you think you might like to work with. And we don't want to encourage codependencies. This is the other main difference oh, yeah, between us yeah. and the, you know, if I want to name, you know, a profession, psychotherapy, very often there are unwholesome codependencies. The, there's no doubt that clients or patients become emotionally dependent on the therapist and the therapist becomes economically dependent on the patient. So it, it, it creates a codependency. Now, it may in the end be still a good, a very good and valuable encounter that they have, but these codependencies are suspect for, well, ethical reasons. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Well, this has been a real delight to get to chat with you about all this. And I think this will be of great interest to uh, many people all all over the place. So uh, thanks so much, Lou, for for joining me for this this morning conversation. And uh, is, is there anything else that you would like to say to have the last word? I don't need the last word, Greg. You, you, I, I just, I just, took my last word is a question. How do you manage to do so many videos? And I just got your email about, about sci-fi. I'm a great sci-fi buff too. Of the older school, you know, Clark. Yes. Yep, Heinlein, yep. Yes. As you know, those guys uh, were fantastic, fantastic, Asimov, fantastic stuff. So I'm amazed at the range and scope of your interests, but thank you very much for having me. And I hope that our conversation will be a benefit to those who see it.